Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to show you how to make a cage crinoline for ball gowns. This video wasn't one I was intending to make anytime soon, but once I started posting my Sally ball gown content, you might have seen it here on Instagram, I started getting quite a few questions about my crinoline. I kind of got to the point where I was like, maybe I should make a video on this. So I asked Instagram, would you guys like if I made a video on how I made this thing? It was like a 100% yes. There was literally, I think I had one no and they messaged me saying they meant to click yes. So I'm gonna break this video into three segments and I will denote them below in what's called chapters. If you hover over the little line here, you'll get to see them broken up. There'll be introduction and then the first part will be materials. This is where I'm going to break down the materials that I use, how much they cost and where I purchase them from. Um, so we're gonna, part one is materials. Part two is gonna be the actual construction of this garment and we're gonna, you're gonna see me make it beginning to end and then the final part, we're gonna do an experiment and see how many of my gowns on top of each other can we fit so that I can, like, without it collapsing. Um, so yeah, that'll be part three. Um, if you are obviously uninterested in any of these parts of it, you can just skip along to the part that you are interested in and uh, go from there. Now, before we dive into materials, here's a quick message from today's sponsor. This video was brought to you by my lovely Kofi supporters. When I asked about making this video on Instagram, I asked if you guys would be interested in supporting a goal to fund the hooping wire for this crinoline, since making cage crinolines, as you're about to see, is rather pricey. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to everyone who supported the Kofi goal and made this video possible. Now, let's talk about materials. I'm going to be using the Truly Victorian pattern 142. It is a, it's for a 1856 cage crinoline or walking cage crinoline. Um, I'll also use the words hoop skirt, hoop, hoop. <laughs> so for me, I'm a size medium. So for this, we will be actually looking at a large because they have anywhere from medium large to extra large and i wanted to get kind of an average uh an average price range versus a um, more like my price um so going with that let's talk about fabric so the fabric that i used is a cotton fabric i used a kona cotton from fabric.com we will just open that up in here and check out their black well we'll do white because most people are probably making these in white i made mine in black white kona cotton and the first one used which i believe is a 44 inch weight uh 44 inch width is $5.99 a yard and this says for the large you would need one and three quarters yards I would just bump it up to two so that puts us at eight dollars and 98 cents for our fabric all right let's go back now to the corset making supply site this is corsetmakingsupply.com or corsetmaking.com and this site is really great for all of the things like obviously corset making but also crinolines farthingales etc so um, we are going to go, the next one that it has you look at is the Grosgrain Ribbon. So it says here um, to use Grosgrain Ribbon, but um, I like to use Twill Tape. So we are going to go in here to the Heavy Cotton Twill Tape by the yard. And it says for the large that you would need five yards. You need five yards for all three sizes that they suggest. So we're going to put five yards of this in our cart. Um, the next one is the bone casing, which they do sell bone casing. We need three quarter of an inch casing because we're actually be going to be getting um, hooping wire, not flat steel. And I'll explain why in a minute. So we need 12 yards of bone casing. All right, so 12 yards of this stuff. Oh, wait, we're getting this in white, not black. Wow, 
You guys, like, clearly all I'm thinking about is the one I made. All right, you could get it in natural as well, but we're gonna go white. So let's stick with this, like, clean aesthetic, right? I made the black, this black in this video because I was kind of just playing around with being gothic, that's all. I just wanted to pretend I was a real goth girl. Um, so now let's go to hooping wire, and this is gonna be really, really important. So we're gonna go up here in boning, and you will see that there is um, hoop boning, and there's a few types of hoop boning. So we're gonna talk about like hooping steel. So there is your plastic covered hoop boning by the yard, um, and this is actually what I recommend. Okay, so you have your hoop steel, and this is just flat steel. Now. This is great and this will work if you have like 15 sets of, of hoops, like if you have 15 like circular items going down your hoop. Now, in this one we only have nine, nine, maybe eight. We only have eight hoops, but you're gonna see by the end of this video how strong this hoop is for only eight hooping wires. In my penne video, up in the corner here, I'll drop it, my grand penne video, I use this stuff in that, and that is how it will, it does not collapse. Um, so that's kind of like my recommendation is this steel hoop boning. Um, the list says we need 21 and a half yards. Uh, so we're gonna need two of these guys. And I personally would much rather buy too much than too little. So that's what we're gonna add. So we got 25 yards purchase. Also, because you have to consider that you're going to be cutting it and you don't want to have to piece boning together. Um, so that we're going to add two 10 yard rolls and a five yard roll. All right. We've got our boning casing, our bone casing, our hooping wire, our fabric, our ribbon. Um, the last thing that we really need to worry about is um, some steel stays or like uh, boning in the video. I actually just use a plastic boning because I'm not really using my corset top for the purpose of um, replacing my corset. So I just use a plastic boning, but like this suggests a white, a quarter inch white steel. Um, and this is their four inches long. So let's, let's see how much that would be. Okay, four inch pieces and we need five of them. Awesome. Add to cart. Sweet. Okay, so now we also need 10 grommet washer sets. 10. So we're going to go down here to grommet and washers. Also, let's consider the price of this is outside of all of the materials or the tools that you need to be able to cut the wire, set the grommets, cut the boning, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, The silver ones look great. All right, here we are. It comes in a size of dozen, so let's add that to our cart, a size of dozen. It comes with one dozen. And then two yards of lacing string, which they also sell. So let's, we will add a five yard one and go from there. Cool. All right, so now let's look at our cart. Let's see, let's see what's up. All right, so we've got our twill uh, bone casing, steel, steel, more steel, and grommets and our corset lacing. Now, this brings us to a total of $188.43. And now we also have to consider the Kona cotton that we're gonna be purchasing, which is $8.98. So there's $9. So before shipping, this is $200. Before shipping any of these items, $200 ruskies. That is right. That's how expensive these things are. Um, now, obviously, they're having a Black Friday sale. So if we were to purchase these things today, we would reach, I think, the 20% off mark. But still, this isn't cheap. Now, this garment took me 11 hours to make. So with 11 hours of work, plus $200 of material cost, that's how much it's gonna cost you to be able to put together this crinoline. Now, let's get to the part that you're all waiting for, and that's making your cage crinoline. 
As I mentioned in the material section of this video, I'm using Truly Victorian pattern 142, which can be purchased on Etsy. I will link it with all of the materials below in the description. And my first step was to actually iron all of these pieces because I have used them previously. Once my pieces were pressed, it was time for me to cut my ribbon and then transfer the markings onto the ribbon guide. Last time I did this, I used chalk, and by the time I actually used the ribbon, a lot of the chalk had worn off, and therefore it was incredibly difficult to line up my ribbon properly. So to mark my ribbon, I'm actually um, using a basting stitch where the markings are. Now this isn't by any means necessary, but this is a very thorough way to ensure that your ribbon stays marked, and I'm using black, so I can't just use a water-soluble marker. I also keep the ribbon pinned to the ribbon guide all the way until I sew it onto the garment. That way I don't mix the different pieces of ribbon up. Once my markings are sewn onto my ribbon, I will cut out my fabric starting with the bag piece on a fold three times and then the corselet pieces making sure to cut my notches as well. Now that my pieces are cut out, I will mark the hoop lines on the bag with my pattern transfer paper and tool. I realized at this point I could have used this for the ribbon, but in all honesty, I was just stalling while waiting for my cotton to finish drying. Then I will also transfer the waist tape markings onto the corselet pieces. To construct the bag, I will be sewing the three bag pieces together in one long strip, lining up the notches as well as my hooping lines. Then I will press the seams to one side and zigzag stitch them down. This will help ease the hooping wire into the channels later when it's time to add the wire. Now I can fold the bag in half and sew it together leaving an 8 inch gap at the top so I can get the wire into the bag later on. Then I will turn the bag right side out and give the entire thing a pretty good pressing. And then I can sew the two ends together and zigzag stitch them to one side. Once the bag is a complete circle and all the seams are zigzag stitched down, it's time to sew the hooping channels. To do this, I'll be measuring 3 inches from the center on each side of the center front seam and then place a pin in between the hooping channel to keep my fabric from shifting while I sew. The bag section is almost done. All that's left is to mark and place the ribbon sections to it. I cut off a piece of my pattern transfer paper and followed the instructions from the chart on page 3 of the instructions. Starting on the left of the center back of the back, I place my markings for each ribbon, then I repeat the process on the right side of the center back. Now that my ribbon placement is marked, I grab my ribbon, which are still pinned to their respective template, and I figure out which side is the top and which side is the bottom, and I pin it to my bag. The instructions say, sew bottom edges of ribbons to top edge of bag so that the last mark is even with the top of the bag. The front edge of each ribbon should match the marks on the bag. 
This is incredibly important for the ribbon placement, so make sure that the front edge of the ribbon lines up with the marking. Otherwise, you could throw the entire hooping structure off and we're not even halfway through this build. Once the ribbon are pinned, I can sew them down, keeping in mind that I will be feeding a half inch wide piece of boning through this channel, so I try to stay close to the top edge of the bag. I also stitch this at a one millimeter stitch length and I go back and forth two times to ensure that it's secure. I set that aside for now and move on to the corselet. Once again, my organization has made it easy for me to find the pieces and line them all up. I'm very familiar with sewing several panels of corset together, so I start by pinning the center back pieces together for both the top and the lining. They are the same fabric, one is just labeled for the waist tape, that's the lining, and one is not. Then I go on to pin all the other sides together in their respective order. The pattern pieces are marked with that order and the instructions reinforce this order so it's pretty easy to just pin them all at the same time so that I can go ahead and sew them all at the same time. Once they are pinned, I can sew them together. I don't think I mentioned this already, but the instructions suggest to sew all seams at a half an inch seam allowance unless otherwise denoted. So I go ahead and sew my seams together. At this point, I should have two corselet layers and I can press my seams open. I use my pressing ham to help with the slight curve at the top and bottom of my pieces. So now I can pin my two corselet layers with their right sides together at the bottom of the corselet. I have skipped pinning where the corselet seams are because this is where we will be feeding our ribbon pieces. Once again, following the instructions on page three, I will pin each ribbon into the respective seam, starting with the center back ribbon and lining up with the center back seam of the corselet. Once all my ribbon pieces have been placed, I will sew the side and bottom seam up. Now I'm going to clip the two corners and then turn this right side out and give it a really good pressing. The next step is to prep for the boning channels for the four inch steel stays. And to do this, I will sew one half of an inch away from the center front pieces, then three eighths of an inch on each side of the center back seam, as well as the seam that connects the side front and side back. This will make five channels for boning. If you bought the four inch steel stays, then you can go grab yourself a cup of tea while I explain how I cut and clean my boning for the boning channels. To cut my plastic boning, I'm gonna be using craft scissors and I'm going to place my piece of boning onto my corselet and cut about a half an inch away from the top edge. Then I will cut two corners off and use my nail file to file down the edge for a rounded edge. I will repeat this process for all five pieces and then I will just place them in the channels that we've already sewn. To finish the top edge, I quickly made some bias tape because I surprisingly did not have any black bias on hand and then just wrapped it around the top edge and stitched it down. The last thing to do before it's time to fuss with hooping wire is to place the grommets. Using the pattern piece for the center front of the corselet, I'll mark my grommet placement. I won't actually show the grommet setting because there's literally no way for me to film it without shaking the camera. So I'll go find a video of how to set grommets and link it in the top corner. On page four of the instructions, there is a hoop wire length chart. 
that breaks down the length you need for each piece of hoop for each size of the hoop. So using this chart, I'm going to cut my boning pieces for hoop numbers 6, 7, and 8. These are the hoops that will live in the bag of the crinoline. Starting with hoop number 8 at 112 inches long, I am going to mark with a sharpie every 20 inches until I reach 112 inches. I'm doing this because sometimes I lose track of my hooping wire and it's just more thorough for me to do it this way. I will also label two inches from the front and two inches at the end so that I can overlap my boning to connect them inside the bag. Then using my wire cutters, I'm going to cut at the 112 inch marking and I have to use a little bit of force to be able to get these apart. So I'll do my cut, I'll bend them backwards and forwards and then I'll cut again. And that's typically all I have to do to get these to pull apart. And then I label it. After hoop numbers six, seven, and eight are cut, I bring back my bag and grab my duct tape. Starting with hoop eight, I will feed my hoop through the channel. And then once it reaches the front again, I will overlap the edges, lining my two inch marks up with each edge of the wire. And then I will wrap it in duct tape at least three times around and move on to the hoop above it. Once all three hoops are placed in the bag, I will pin the opening and bring it over to my sewing machine to sew it closed. At this point, it's easiest to cut and label wires one through five according to the chart on page four. And then I moved to the floor where I had my hoop pinned to my dress form and I grabbed my hoop casing and instructions. Something that I do with my hoop casing is I cut two inches longer than the suggested length because it's easier to trim that away if it's too much, but if it's not enough, then, well, you'd have to recut the whole thing, and if you didn't purchase enough hooping wire for that, things can get really stressful really fast. So starting with hoop casing for hoop five, I cut the casing. Then using the chart for bone casing in size medium, I will label my casing accordingly. This is super important because these markings will guide where the hoop is placed on the structure on the form. Once my casing is marked, I'll add my hooping wire and just like for my bag, I will overlap the edges, tape them, and then feed them into the casing. I will hand sew the casing closed later, but I don't actually get video of this. So to do this, I just whip stitch the casing pieces together at the front and the back of the boning wire or hooping wire. Starting at the back of the hoop, I will pin and place the hooping wire up the center back marking with the center back ribbon placing the hoop directly below the marking on the ribbon. I will continue doing this all the way to the front making sure that the hooping wire 
is below the ribbon marking and the mark on the hooping wire is lined up with the front edge of the ribbon. All right, so I'm not gonna hand sew anything closed or up until everything's pinned, um, but just so you have an idea of what it looks like, at the front, like left, if you're looking at it, not if it's worn, you're gonna have your um, marking on this side, and then this is the top of the channel. So if I take you out a bit, you can see there, and all the way up, but now, if we go to the, uh, the right side, like this one, there we go, okay. You can see my marking is on this side and at the top. So what the instructions say is that your marking on your hoop should always be closer to the center than the actual overlap. So when you overlap this on all of them, your marking should be on the side that's closest to the center front. And if you did that right, for all of your pieces of boning, your hoop will look like this, and it'll move like this. Let's see how much, yeah, look at that swing. Now we've got to hand sew these all down. I'm going to start by saying this part is tedious. It takes quite a bit of time and it's rather difficult for me to get a decent shot of it because I just love putting my hand right where the camera is trying to capture, but I promise I tried. So to sew this down, I do a very short stitch to the top of the hoop. Then I will whip stitch around the side of the hoop down to the bottom. I will stitch another very short stitch across the bottom of the casing, and then I will whip stitch back up to the top of the hoop, finishing off where I started. Each connection takes about five to seven minutes, and there are 35 connections on this hoop. Wear a thimble, take breaks, and work in whichever way you are comfortable. If you're comfortable sewing this by machine, then please be my guest. I in fact am not, and therefore I will continue to make my cage crinoline in this manner. All right, now time for the part I'm sure you were all waiting for, and that is the experiment. But first, I think I'm gonna need to change my clothes. All right, that looks much better. I had to open the door so that Eva can hang out with us. But now we're gonna put this on and then we're gonna do an experiment where I'm going to weigh myself with the hoop. And then um, once I've weighed myself with the hoop on, we're gonna add some petticoats and some skirts and some layers to it. And my trusty assistant, Toby, is going to uh, help. The first thing to do in this experiment is to note how much I weigh with just all of these garments before adding the rest, and that's 146.4 pounds. So with one petticoat, we obviously already know the crinoline looks fine. Now to add a second organza petticoat. Again, it looks pretty normal aside from how fluffy this is. The third petticoat is actually a cotton petticoat from my Ariel ball gown, and this one is a bit heavier than the other two, but still no change in the shape of the hoop. At this stage, we're up to 153.6 pounds, so let's add some more. Belle's lace underskirt is the skirt that warped all of the $20 Amazon hoops I tried, and this is the point that I'm prepared for the hoop to start collapsing. And it looks fine, so let's see what it's like with Belle's overskirt. <laughs> this garment puts the total weight of everything so far at 158.8 pounds. So we are about 12 pounds more than we were when we started. 
and I still think this looks pretty circular. We're not a lima bean, we're not a grand penier, we're not a elliptical, we are still pretty much a circle. And we have one more dress to try, and this one's gonna be a bit difficult because it is a underskirt, which you see me putting on here. That's fine, that's no big, ish, big issue, but then um, the actual dress itself is like open in the front, as you'll see here in a second, and that does create a weird elliptical shape. I am not 100% sure if it's due to weight or the the placement of weight, but this is what we're considering the breaking point because you'll see in a second. So at this point I weigh 164.6 pounds and we're uh, 18 pounds above what we started at. And then just for lols, we've wrapped two blankets around my waist and decided to see what would happen. So clearly the like the hooping structure doesn't break and it still is in that little bit of a weird uh, angle. It just looks a little bit like off, like it's a little bit um, elliptical. But at this point, I weighed 174 pounds. So we are just shy of 30 pounds more than we were and I don't know this was just absolutely ridiculous and I can't believe we did it <laughs> there you guys have it how I made my cage crinoline and then also how much weight it was able to hold before starting to kind of like lose its circular shape and go more elliptical we made it almost up to 30 pounds which is pretty ridiculous um but Hey, we did it. Uh, thank you guys again so much for watching this video, for watching, uh, for, you know, just being here. I hope you found this, like, educational and helpful. Um, I hope I answered all of your questions about cage crinolines. I know there's a lot um, to it, but, uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video, if you like sewing, if you like Disney historical costuming, please subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up and comment below let me know what you're working on let me know how you felt about this video and if you would like to support my art you can head on over to patreon um i do have a patreon and uh, i'll link that up here and also down there um that's all for today guys i'll see you guys in the next one bye wee 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 wee